Not long before ascending from heaven, Jesus spent some time with his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. Don't get confused, Tiberias is on the northwestern portion of the Sea of Galilee. It's a city there. And so it's often called the city of Tiberias or the city of the region, which is Galilee, the city of Galilee. He had instructed the disciples to meet him there in Galilee. And while waiting for the Lord, Peter said, I'm going fishing. There were several of his disciples, the Lord's disciples with Peter at that time. For some of them, it was their former livelihood. It was what was natural to them. Long before Jesus called them to be fishers of men, they were fishing for a living as men. I don't know if Peter was motivated to just pass the time while he was waiting on the Lord, or maybe he knew that they would soon be hungry and needed something to eat, or maybe he had decided, enough with this, I'm going back to fishing. He had already walked away from the boats and the nets and all the gear, but he decided to go back on that particular evening. While he's waiting for the Lord, he did not know that Jesus knew of his struggles and his doubts and his disappointments and his experiences of inner turmoil that he had. No doubt the questions still lingered and the regret was still pretty sore. And that settling shame of sin must have been very deep in Peter, maybe even the quandary of a plan B. Jesus, of course, knew all of that, knew everything that Peter was wrestling with, everything that you and I wrestle with. And the Lord determined in that time to go to where Peter was located and to restore him and to redirect him back to the mission that he had been called to. Peter had said, I'm going fishing, and some of them went with him. The twin went, his name is Thomas. Zebedee's sons, James and John, were there, along with two other, the disciples, with Peter, out for an all-night fishing. And you know what they caught? Absolutely nothing. As the morning sun's rays overtook the darkness of night, Jesus was standing on the shore, unbeknownst to the disciples. I can't help but wonder, how long had he been there? Had he been watching them all night long, just protectively watching? Did he spend the night there on the shore, praying to his father, knowing the conversation that he had come to have? Or did he just rest peacefully? As the morning sun rays take over that darkness, Jesus had prepared breakfast for them. Grilled fish, fresh bread. It was all there on an open fire, a coal fire. And the Lord called out to the men to bring the, some of the fish that they had just caught by his miraculous command. 153 fish moved right into the nets that had been empty all night long. They were astounded that Jesus gave such a haul, such a miracle. And they did bring some of the fish ashore for the Lord to add what he had already prepared for them. The good shepherd gathered the men on the shore that morning to feed them, to guide them, to speak truth to them, no doubt. But by the end of their time together, they understood the Lord's shepherding, nurturing way and they heard with clarity that they were to shepherd the flock of God, not spend their time on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, with their bellies full and their spirits encouraged, lifted by the presence of the Christ himself. Jesus turned his attention to Peter and said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these I don't know what the these refers to. It might be the fish that were right there. Do you love me more than fish, fishing? Do you love me more than the nets and the boat? Do you love me more than the men who are gathered around you? Do you love me more than these? 
I like that he left it open-ended. It makes you and me ponder the same question. Do I love him more than these? That which is endeared in my life, that which I spend time on, that which I hunger for, do I love him more than these? And of course, the, Jesus uh, asking that, Peter responds, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And listen to what he says. Peter, tend my lambs. Now, we often think of lambs and sheep as being interchangeable in terms, and although they represent the same animal, lambs represents the youngest of the flock. It's the most vulnerable, the most needy. And he says to Peter, if you love me, you feed my lambs, those who need help. A shepherd cannot have divided love. They must love the master above all things. And the expression of that love that a shepherd has for the master will be evident in that the sheep belong to him and he is willing and ready to feed them. Divided love makes a shepherd nothing more than a hireling. And Jesus was asking Peter to clarify his love for him because he was not calling him to be a hireling. He was calling him to be a shepherd who would express his ministry out of deep love for Christ. The pinnacle role of the shepherd is to feed the lambs, to take God's word and feed it, to teach it, to communicate so that our spirits and our soul and our minds are satisfied with the good things of God. It's the primary role that I have to feed. Then a second time, Jesus asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And of course, he responds, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus added, tend my sheep. Poiment is the word that he used there. It's the word that is translated tend. It's also translated in 1 Peter chapter 5 as shepherd. And now we're sensing a deeper understanding of what God was calling Peter and the others to do. Feed my lambs and shepherd my sheep. Provide for them, guide them, live with them, love them. Encourage them. Then Jesus said a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. He was really grieved that Jesus would have asked him this a third time. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. I don't know this to be true, but I think it's in this moment that it kind of clicked for Peter. I think he understood the charcoal flames that were flickering there, the smell of the smoke that had lifted and lingered all around them, the wood crackling there, the morning chill being exchanged for that cold night light coming to where there was darkness. It's reminiscent of Peter standing just outside the door where evil men were inquiring of the Lord they were guided by the forces of hell in their interrogation of Jesus that day. But Peter was standing just outside, warming himself at a charcoal fire that had been built by the officials and the servants of that which was taking place. And a girl, a servant, said of him, I know you're associated with him. And Peter outright denied it. I am not. Then warming himself by another charcoal fire right outside of Caiaphas' home. Someone identified him as a disciple of Christ and Peter outright rejected it. I am not. And then for the third time right outside of the high priest's area, the servants of the priest were there. And there was one who was a relative of the man who Peter attempted to kill, cut his ear right off. And that man said, I know, I saw you in the garden with him, didn't I? And Peter rebuked him, with, filled with hatred in a way, saying, I was not, I am not. And then the rooster crowed. You, you remember the narrative. It's on the shore 
with Jesus and the other disciples. Peter, filled with remorse and regret and repentance, just a few days earlier, with the same type fired, flames dancing, the cold of dark of night, his rejection of Christ was clear. But now he sits with Jesus, the very one he had denied, at the fire in the morning's light. The fire built by him, by the Lord, warmed the apostle physically, but really, What Jesus was doing was stoking a flame within his spirit, stoking the flame, the call of God in his soul, in his very depth of being, confronting him with his sin and restoring him in his way with mercy and grace that only Jesus can do. So Peter's presence there along with the other disciples, they were gathered there that day by a shepherd the good shepherd who was showing his genuine love for them. They had been scattered. They had been scared by the threat of persecution. No doubt the reality of persecution. But yet Jesus, the good shepherd, had gathered them because it was there in his presence that forgiveness was abounding and restoration was resounding and fear was being dispelled. It's the place in the presence of Christ where that kind of ministry takes place. The very things that Peter had run from, sin, mission, and fear, Jesus had come to speak into him, confronting those things, forgiving him of those things, and restoring him, acknowledging with truth and promise and real provision. I don't know all that you've been going through, but I can tell you if you've got regret and remorse, And have repentance, Jesus is offering to you those same things. In his mercy and grace, he's calling you near to himself. That's the background that I think brings us to the first four verses of 1 Peter chapter 5. It's that moment that Peter recognized Jesus as the good shepherd like never before who is gathering, not scattering, who is calling to himself those who are wounded and scared, frightened, like one of 99 that had departed. It's that moment that Peter begins to understand the fullness of what it is to be a shepherd, to hear the call of Christ, for him to be a shepherd to his flock. Then we read these first four verses in 1 Peter chapter 5. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness of the suffering of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd, tend the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not for domineering over those in your charge but being examples to the flock and when the chief shepherd appears you will receive the unfading crown of glory so it's experiencing this great pastoral care of the good shepherd that Peter says to the church elders shepherd the flock of God among you shepherding them, encouraging them to lead the church well in the same way that Christ leads the elders well. I want to give you a couple of statements, and they're going to flash on the screens. I'd like it if you just concentrate with me on them. Genuine church leaders are those shepherded by Jesus, serving as his under-shepherds, reflecting his personal nature, his pastoral nature, I should say. So Jesus has this real pastoral way as the good shepherd and those who are leaders of the church have recognized that, have experienced that and are continuing to do so. And in that experience, they too are to shepherd the flock of God that is among them in the way that Christ has shepherded them and is continuing his pastoral ways. Let it be that that's the way that church leaders shepherd their flocks. Now I can tell you I fall far short of that. 
And I don't mind telling you as well that the rest of the pastors and lay shepherds here at Meadowbrook fall well short of that. But it is our objective. The way that we're experiencing Christ is the manner in which we ought to be expressing our love and care for you. But look at this. The true church members are part of God's flock under the attention of Jesus, the good shepherd, who calls men to feed and tend those who belong to him. So those who are true to the church are those who are truly in the flock of God. And you have to know that you are under the constant gaze of Christ, the constant care of Christ. And he has called some in the church, men, to be the ones to tend and to feed you under his care and provision. So although Peter is directing his words in chapter 5 to elders, throughout the New Testament, Christ's followers who are filled with his spirit are to feed and tend others as Jesus has tended and fed them. So I'm calling for all of us to have a pastoral way. There might be some who are ordained as pastors, set apart by the church in unique positions, but all of us have an obligation because we have received Christ and know his ministry in this way. All of us have an obligation to serve and tend and feed each other, to have a pastoral way about us. So I want to consider for a few moments the characteristics of sheep and what we ought to be doing with one another to encourage each other in the flock of God. You'll see that I'm going to talk about sheep and shepherds. Let's look at the first idea here. Wandering sheep get lost easily, so we ought to stay close to home. Unlike many other animals, sheep don't have a general sense of direction that's very good. And as a result, they can quickly and thoroughly get lost in any time they venture away from home. I have had animals along with my kids and my wife and most all those animals find their way back. Whether it's a dog that go, goes off for a while, they have an uncanny ability to get back home. Uh, the first cat that lasted a long time at our house, his name was Sambo, and uh, we loved that cat. He was uh, with our family for a long time. But every now and then for about four, five, six days, that, that rascal would just go away. And I would think uh, he's not coming back. But he would inevitably come back scrappy, a <laughs> little thinner, uh, a little beat up. But he would always be able to venture his way back home. Until one day he didn't. And I assume like a lot of cats, he had just gone off and died. They have a tendency to do that. Until April the 1st. When I went to the front door and the kids were at the table eating breakfast and I opened the door and I say, Sambo! And all the kids jumped up from their cereal and Pop-Tarts and ran to the front door. And in the evil tone that I had, I closed the door and said, just kidding, April Fools, and walked away. Isn't that horrible? <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> I didn't know I had so many cat lovers in the house. I would dare not tell that story about a dog, but a cat? <laughs> What's the big deal? Uh, he lived a long, long life. But when you put a sheep in a pasture, he's all good. He's a very habitual animal in the respite of the heat of the day, he will go back to the same place. And they have a natural way at their home pasture to know exactly where the fold is and they'll go right back to the fold as the sun is setting and they just have that way about them when they're in familiar territory. But if somebody was to take them away from their home pasture, the fields that they're customary in, if a shepherd leads them away or some beast runs them and they get distracted and scattered, they are not going to be able to find their way back home. God has not given them that ability. I've told you before we have some geese that show up at our property and inevitably every spring they're back and they will lay their eggs and 
we'll have a new little flock that will come out of that. Now, you don't, do you call them flocks, sheep? I mean, geese? Whatever. We have a few sheep. Uh, uh, geese, excuse me. <laughs> Did you know that geese can actually fly two to 3,000 miles in order to get back to where they were born? And they do it over and over and over annually. Depending on the winds, they can actually fly a thousand miles in a 24 hour period to get back home. Astonishing. Sheep are not like that. God has not given them this innate ability to be able to navigate back home. They cannot find their way. Now listen, they are useful, they are purposeful, they are beautiful, they are quite contrary to popular belief, smart. However, it is undeniable they are supremely challenged when it comes to directions. There are over one billion sheep in the world. But if it were not for the caretakers and the shepherds who are with them, navigating with them, they would soon be decimated in numbers because they would not be able to find green pastures on their own and they would not find the still waters that they need. They would be very vulnerable. Sheep need to stay home, close to home. Now let me encourage you, Meadowbrook, to stay where God has placed you. Now, assuming that you're obedient to the Spirit's call, he has placed you here at Meadowbrook. Let me encourage you, stay close to Meadowbrook. Stay near to us. One of the great tragedies of COVID and that season of life beyond the sickness and the death was that many people got scattered away from home. They got removed from home and statistics show right now in the U.S., 30% of those who left during COVID have not found their way back to the church. Uh, without being too blunt, some of you are watching right now on our streaming services. And I'm telling you, come home. Come home. Are you flourishing spiritually there in your living room with your cup of coffee in hand? Are you growing in the things of Christ? Because I can tell you, the church is not growing without your presence to the measure that the Spirit of God had inclined for us. Come home. Come home. And for those of you who are cyclic in your attendance and you're disengaged in ministry, you are not flourishing in the skills that God has given you edifying, building up the body of Christ. Get engaged. Come every Sunday. Come to this place. Be in ministry together because we need each other in God's fold. Come home and stay home. Something or someone may have changed your thoughts and feelings and you have wandered away from church Still, the shepherd has placed you here among the sheep. So I implore you, come back. Come back home. And when life's changes drive you into the wilderness, maybe you've gotten used to the fact that you can live in the spiritual wildernesses of life. But I'm telling you, you will not flourish in those places. Come home. Come home. We miss you, we want you, we need you, we love you. Sheep do best when they're close to home. Loving shepherds lead people home to Christ and seek to gather them, never, never to scatter them. The role of the shepherd is constantly to gather, never to scatter when the prophet Isaiah communicated the lostness of mankind, he did so using an illustration of sheep. He said, all we like sheep have gone astray, each to his own way. We've all gone our separate ways. We've turned. Isn't that amazing how sheep communicate well about our own ways and our thoughts? 
When Jesus communicated his love for and his mission to people who are lost, he did so by using an illustration of sheep. He says in Luke chapter 15, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. When he finds it, he lays it on his shoulder rejoicing. And he comes, when he comes home, he calls to his friends and neighbors saying to them, rejoice with me. I found the sheep that was lost. So I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Shepherds are constantly looking, constantly calling, constantly gathering, never scattering, wanting the hundred to be together. Jeremiah had a woeful statement to the shepherds who failed to recognize this and to demonstrate He says, woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel concerning the shepherds who care for my people. You have scattered my flock. You have driven them away. You have not attended to them. What does that mean? You've not fed them. You've not tended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. See, we are always to be gathering, never scattering. Be careful the words that you choose when you're describing God, church, ministry, and the saints of God. Be careful, my friends, because your words might be scattering words and not gathering words. Be careful, oh, you gossips. You naysayers, you backbiters, because you are a scatterer, not a gatherer. And unto Christ himself, he says, woe, woe to the shepherds who scatter the flock. So sheep must be careful not to be scattered, to be careful Avoiding being led astray because there are lots of people who want to lead you astray. I did a little study today, uh, this past week, uh, little Google searches about sheep that get drawn away, led astray. Did you know there's Judas sheep and Judas goats I found an essay that was actually printed in multiple papers throughout the U.S. in 1926, April of 1926. It's unsigned, so I can't give the person credit for it. But if you don't mind, let me just read this little article that was the essay. It's titled as Humans and Sheep. If you want a little lesson in sheep nature that's a lesson of human nature as well, Go to the sheep pen of the slaughterhouse. Down below are hundreds of sheep. They're all alike. There's very little to distinguish one from another. They crowd about in a woolly mass which shifts from here and there about the pen. One bleats and they all bleat. The mass moves this way and that. Then a man leans over to a wise looking old sheep wearing a bell. The old sheep bleats understandingly and starts walking towards the killing room. The bell tinkles that the sheep follow, and the sheep follow that sound, follow the bell weather, their leader. Up to the very door of the slaughterhouse, the mass moves. Then the man calls to the leader again, and the old bell weather leaps to one side. He stands watching his fellows pass to their doom. Eagerly, the creatures run through the door to their death. Every day it's repeated, the Judas sheep leads thousands of his fellows to their betrayal. And thousands always follow, bleeding timidly, rushing blindly. But always, on the threshold of death, their leader steps aside to safety. If a sheep could only investigate, if one sheep and all those thousands would only stand at the gate of death and turn to his fellows, fight them back to safety. But the sheep thinking is the thinking of the mass, the mob that runs blindly guided by the straw of instinct. The sheep don't stop to investigate. They hear the tinkle of the bell and they follow. In the world, how many are there like that? A Judas sheep. No, we've got to be careful not to be led astray. 
John instructs us in 1 John chapter 4, my beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. And just a few verses from where we are, Peter in chapter 5, verse 8 is going to write, be sober-minded, be watchful, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Paul in Acts 17 encourages us to be noble like the Bereans who received the word of God with eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if those things are so. You see what he's saying there? In all three of those instances, he's saying, be alert. There are some who are going to want to lead you astray unto death. Be alert. No, is it of God? How do I know it's of God? God will never contradict himself. The things that you're being told, they ought to be matching perfectly what you know about God. How do you know things about God? He has written it for you, declared it in his word. Test everything that is said to be spiritual and from God. Test it to the measurement of God's word. And if it falls short, you run and come back home. Wandering sheep are vulnerable, so stay close to home. And sheep often eat indiscriminately, exposing themselves to poisons. Unlike other animals, sheep are not innately alert to harmful plants. You'll find sheep munching on grass and clover and legumes and forbs. A forb is a, is a flowered plant, unlike a grass, but... Uh, is rich in nutrition, and they're, they're after that. But they'll be sick if they start eating on milkweed or morning glories or ivy or mountain laurel or wild cherry or probably are going to die if they eat St. John's wort plant and other plants that are harmful to them. They, they have an indiscriminate way in eating, so they, you have to be very guarded as a shepherd what the sheep are eating. So loving shepherds discriminately feed the sheep under their care. A shepherd has to prepare for the sheep to eat. He has to go before them observing the pastures and the fields for which they might ingest things. He has to be insightful and knowledgeable in order to protect them about what is bad. I can tell you we are very concerned at Meadowbrook about what is being fed. The food in which we eat as a congregation by preaching and teaching and singing and reading, all of that has been carefully thought out, prayed over and vetted, and we do everything in our power to make sure nothing but good spiritual food comes out of our mouths. And we're concerned about so-called Christian radio and podcasts and music and shows and books and TV and movies and even other churches that claim to be teachers of God's word. We're concerned about that. I could go on and on, but you know what I'm saying. You and I need to be given to the counsel of God's word and be careful and sensitive when Somebody says that something is of God and they can't tell you the book, chapter, or verse for which it comes from this Bible. Be careful. I could go on and on about the characteristics of sheep, about how they have the tendency to be cast in the heaviness of their wool and need a shepherd to right them. I, I could talk about their vulnerability and no means by which they can protect themselves and how God has to step in and be the protector for them. But I, I want to conclude with this one. And that is, sheep have faults that only the good shepherd can resolve. There's some faults that sheep have that only a shepherd is going to be able to take care of. Unlike the photos and the images that you've seen in Sunday school all the years of your life, sheep are dirty and stinky animals. I took a group from Meadowbrook, the 55 plus, to a local sheep farm and I felt somewhat responsible once I was there for subjecting them to the foul odors that we encountered. Every snarled lip and every pinched nose and every reflex of gag that I saw while we were there, I had some sense of responsibility and it 
Turns out that what we discovered on that particular field trip is that sheep are not white and fluffy and bounding animals that you just are goo-goo-eyed over. In fact, they are dirty, they are matted, and they are covered in flies. Do you know how a shepherd cleans the sheep? He doesn't wash them in wool light. <laughs> you can't spruce them up by washing them. Instead, he has to get rid of the dirt by shearing off all the wool. Because there the wool is matted. And every weed and seed that has gotten into it gets matted into it every dirt and fecal matter that he rolls around in is caked up into that and there is no way to clean that out of him the lanolin builds up so thick and it's and it's wool that it just is a matted mess so he takes that sheep and he just cuts it all off just has to get rid of it all together. And I want to remind you, my friends, as sheep, you are not going to be able to clean yourself up from a life of sin. You need a good shepherd to eradicate that from you. You need him to remove it. You're not going to be able to clean it up on your own. You're not going to get rid of the stains on your own. Our salvation comes in Christ by grace through faith, trusting that he alone can remove our sin from us and make us white. And Jesus, of course, took our sin upon himself on Calvary's cross in order that we might be freed from it. So in Christ, we are not captive to sin any longer. We are not judged in our sin and we are no longer dead in our sin in fact, quite the opposite is true. We are alive in the righteousness of Christ with his presence. And in Christ, we are made new, justified by him, declared righteous and put on a path of righteousness, which is a holy life, sanctified life, a life that moves in destiny to eternity with him in the new heaven and the new earth which is my final point, that the good shepherd laid down his life for his sheep, giving us newness of life by faith. Peter understood all that. And it took him a while. It took him a lot of mistakes and corrections by Jesus. It took a broken man on the shore of the northern sea of Galilee hearing from his Savior, do you love me? Then tend my lambs. Do you love me? Then pastor my sheep. Do you love me? Then feed those little ones. Feed those adults, the sheep. What you've received from me, give to others. As I look around and see you and you look around and see one another, this is our call. Tend to the little ones. Feed them. Nurture them. Care for them. Be engaged in the preschool ministry, the children's ministry, the student ministry, the young adult ministry. When you have a new follower of Christ, you see them come through the baptismal waters. Feed those little ones. Disciple them. This is our call to one another that we would pastor, tend to each other, that we would show great care and affection for one another and provide as each other needs. And in the end, this is our call as we look to one another right now and in the next hour in life group. You look around to those that you catch eyes with and you know your call is to feed the sheep. And you can do it. Why? Because Christ fed you. Christ tends to you. Christ cares for you. Help us, Lord. In the way that we have experienced your love, let us be loving. In the way that we have been given your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness, your truth, Lord, let us be free to give it to others. In the way that you have shepherded us, let us be shepherds to one another. 
And I pray in the end it would bring glory to Christ who has not only shown the way but is the way. So help us, God. Amen.